Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Molly O'Mara, Associate Director of External Relations for the Birthing Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, we are thrilled uh, to partner with UMass and CMAS for this event this evening. Uh, we have a fantastic panel of young alumni who are entrepreneurs and thriving in the space. We also have two fantastic moderators who are entrepreneurs as well, an alum and a one of our current seniors. Uh, I will throw it now to Wilma Crespo and Gregory Thomas. Wilma. Awesome. Thank you so much, Molly. And thank you all for making time to be here. Um, as Molly said, I'm Wilma Crespo, she, her pronouns, and I am the director of CMAS, the Center for Multicultural Advancement and Student Success. Part of us coming together to host an event like this is to not only share the resources that the campus has connected to alums, but also to encourage you because we all know that um, as seniors are thinking of graduating and the economy that we're facing, those are some of the concerns that are present in students' minds. And so we always try to be student-centered and provide resources whenever we can to do that. Um, so along those lines, I just wanna take a minute to share about CMAS. We are currently providing three virtual programs uh, to support students in their sense of belonging and student success. One of those is success coaching. It's a way to connect with a professional staff on campus. Uh, look at it as another layer of support um, that teams up with your academic advisor. And so success coaches uh, meet with students individually trying to identify what are your goals for your academic endeavors and connect you to resources, but also uh, focus much more on what you wanna accomplish and your action plans for that and to support you through that. The other piece is graduation, um, graduate school preparation program. So we know that uh, career world may be down the path, but also you may be thinking about graduate school. We have a graduate assistant who is uh, wonderful and very resourceful. And so it's ready to assist students with that application process. And we also have many cultural programs through our four cultural centers. Um, if you check out our website, you will see the spread of events now uh, to celebrate Latino Heritage Month and upcoming, we will be celebrating Native, Native Heritage and Black Heritage and Asian Heritage as well. So do not hesitate to reach out if there is anything CMAS can do for you. Um, our website is umass.edu backslash C-M-A-S-S. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Berthium for hosting with us. Um, I'll turn it over to Greg. Good evening. I'm Gregory Thomas. I'm the executive director for the Bethune Center for Entrepreneurship. And uh, it's good to be here with you this evening. Uh, thank you to, um, to Wilma uh, for the, um, her great idea of getting you together tonight to talk about entrepreneurship, innovation, and you doing more with your ideas uh, with the campus's help. Uh, the Bethune Center uh, for Entrepreneurship, if I could just take a few minutes um, to explain is a, what I like to call a pan-campus center. We support the whole center for the chancellor and his aspirational uh, vision for the University of Massachusetts to be um, the destination of choice for students, faculty, staff, um, and our ecosystem that want to be and that are innovators and entrepreneurs. And how do we do that? How do we work with you as students? Um, uh, one of the ways is we have office hours where MBA fellows, myself and Carly, um, listen to you, support your ideas and, and work with you to advance your ventures. Um, um, in addition to that, we have a program specially focused on transfer students and first year students called the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Scholars Program, where we help to fund you advancing your, your ventures on uh, $250 a semester. Um, we have uh, two clubs and one special program um, operated out of the center. Um, and I think um, uh, the co-leader of the entrepreneurship club, um, Alvin is on the call tonight. Um, Alvin, welcome um, uh, the uh, co-leader of the entrepreneurship club. Uh, in addition to the entrepreneurship club, we have the social entrepreneurship club, uh, both focused on helping you to advance your ventures. Um, in addition to that, we, uh, Jada um, is on the call tonight. She's one of our facilitators. She's also the campus director for the Holt Pride, the number one social entrepreneurship challenge in the world. Where in the end, in the end of the Holt competition, the winner will be awarded a million dollars. 
Now our our challenge next, I just reviewed with you the clubs, I reviewed with you the sponsor, the um, scholars program and the MBA fellows that are doing office hours. But I'd also like to talk to you about the innovation challenge. The innovation challenge is where we give away over $80,000 in equity free funding to ventures. Just last week, we gave away over $64,000 to four ventures who competed in our final that we had postponed from last spring and kicked off the semester with this year. Um, that, that money is given so that you can advance your ventures. And these this four part series, the Innovation Challenge, allows you to pitch your venture to judges and win cash. Um, there's the minute pitch where you just pitch for a minute. A seed pitch in the semifinal are boardroom shark tank-ish um, type competitions. And if you win the semifinal, you'll go on to the final. So those are our innovation challenge. Those are some of the things that the Bethune Center for Entrepreneurship does to support the campus um, uh, with the, uh, the schools and colleges across UMass um, um, providing support and facilitation to help us to be great, to help us to take you with innovative ideas, with an entrepreneurship mindset and to turn that into profit uh, for your business and to, to, um, to also help to support impact in our community. Um, and so with that, I'd like to um, uh, next to introduce to you uh, our panelists, um, for, not our panelists, I'm sorry, our moderators for the evening. Um, and, and first, uh, before I do that, I'd just like to thank Molly O'Mara, the um, Associate Director uh, for the Bethune Center for Entrepreneurship for putting this together and getting everybody on this call tonight, which is no small feat. Um, and so first I'd like to introduce you um, Susan Callender. Susan is a good friend. We served on the Alumni Association board together when I was the president. Um, she was a great supporter there um, and um, has channeled her energy to get us all on this call tonight, um, whether she knows it or not. Um, and so Susan, if you could say a few words um, um, and, and as means of introduction, um, we would appreciate it. Thank you, Gregory. I'm Susan Callender, class of 86. I am currently the founder and chief confidence officer at businessclass.expert. That is the third company that I've started since graduating from UMass because what I learned on that campus was that I am a creative, innovative human being and I can pivot at any moment. It's my pleasure to be here this evening. And now I'd like to introduce you to Jada. Hi everyone, my name is Shada Fonfield. I'm a current senior economics um, major here at UMass and I am also an entrepreneur and I'm super excited to be moderating this panel and hearing from other alumni entrepreneurs here on this call tonight. So I'll kind of segue and get us started and get the ball rolling. So it's no um, easy thing to do to kind of start your own business. So I'll ask Chris, what inspired you to start your own business? Yes, uh, so great to be here. Um, I am a graduate of 2012 from the business school, did marketing and sports management. And I was inspired to start my own business when I was about 13 years old and I was mowing my parents' lawn and my parents were paying me in Pokemon cards and I wanted to make real money. And so I started going to my neighbors and asking them if they would pay me. And my next door neighbor said yes. And that was what started my landscaping business, which I did all throughout UMass. So that really kind of planted the seeds in entrepreneurship in me because I could go out there, I could uh, kind of work in the sun, make my own hours, hire my friends. And I thought this is amazing. I don't know why everyone wouldn't want to do this. And then I have started other ventures since then. But that was really what got things kicked off for me. Melissa? Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Castro, class of 2010. Um, what motivated me to start my venture was really um, how I grew up. So I grew up in New York City in a family of uh, caterers, uh, street vendors, you name it. We were all involved in the kitchen. Um, food is the way we kind of express our love with one another. Um, and as I grew older and I traveled, I noticed that you know, there are over 33 countries that represent Latin America and the Caribbean, but only a select few are prominent in the American dining industry. So when I went back to graduate school, I started a business called La Conexión, 
which is a marketplace that curates um, food experiences, food experiences for food lovers. So think uh, food pop-ups and cooking classes, as well as um, food and beverage consulting for small businesses to try to help this dynamic um, kind of challenge that we have in the industry to really show people that Latin heritage is more than just tacos, um, which is mostly what people think when they think of Latin foods and really trying to share the, the overall diaspora of who we are through food. I love that, Melissa, thank you. Next we have Michelle Delzon. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here. I am a graduate of UMass class of 2010. Um, I started the BOM, the Black Owned Market, and it is a curated shopping destination that makes buying from Black owned brands convenient. And I really started it um, because of the inspiration from my parents. My parents are Haitian immigrants, um, first generation, and when they moved here, I think they really just wanted to survive in a land that was really unknown to them at the time. And a way to kind of get out of poverty um, was through entrepreneurship. And they started a beauty supply store in 1988, and it's the same age as me. And through that business, I was able to pay for my fees at UMass, um, attend private high school, and just any extracurricular activities, the same for my siblings. So um, when I went to UMass, I think it really taught me that I wanted to be more creative. Um, and even moving to New York City, where I lived for eight years, there were so many Black entrepreneurs in my neighborhood, but there was no easy or convenient way to shop with them. And I read this stat on the NAACP's website that said Black people have over $1.2 trillion in buying power, but only two cents of every dollar goes back into Black-owned businesses. And I really wanted to make it more accessible um, to really introduce these small black business owners to their intended consumer. So I got my start with the bomb in December of 2016 and have never looked back. And what a great time for you. Thank you so yeah. much, Michelle. And um, Tenzin Darwin, Darwa Farge, pardon me, Tenzin, welcome. Thank you. And first and foremost, thanks. Um, to the hosts this evening. It's really great to be back at Alma Mater, albeit virtually, um, and to help CMAS, which was so instrumental in my career at UMass. Uh, I'm a 2018 graduate. Uh, I did a dual degree in political science and Chinese. Uh, currently, I'm a master's student at Columbia University at the School of International Public Affairs, where I'm reading for a master's in international affairs. And I'm also a State Department Charles B. Rangel Fellow. Uh, the entrepreneurial venture that I have uh, is called Yeti. Uh, Y-E-T-I, and that's an acronym uh, that stands for Young Educated Tibetans Initiative. So I'm Tibetan in heritage and my parents came here um, through a diversity uh, visa lottery program uh, in the 90s. And this is um, when the Tibetan diaspora began to come into America. And I realized here in Boston that I was very fortunate that um, through mentors, Tibetan and non-Tibetan, that I was able to get to where I am. So really when I was a junior at UMass in 2017, I was reflecting with one of my other Tibetan friends about um, the experiences that we'd had and we identi identified it down to mentors. Um, so that's what really prompted me and my other Tibetan friend um, to create this virtual initiative um, to connect Tibetans um, with mentors uh, virtually because our community is quite scattered. So uh, we're a virtual mentorship program. We're entering our third year. Um, and I really got the entrepreneurial uh, spirit sort of from UMass, not from uh, business ventures, but um, through putting on panels and uh, having discussions, which CMAS was so instrumental um, in, in putting together. So that's uh, my background. That's pretty great as well. Thanks so much, Tenzin. Um, is Ellis on the call? Then let's loop back around to Chris. You already gave us some great background. Thanks so much for that. Um, tell me, when did you, or how did you create your first business plan and did the original concept of your business change at all since that time? Yeah, so I definitely did not create a business plan to start off. I was just like, all right, we've had this idea and actually I, so right now I'm not still doing the landscaping. Um, I actually started a couple of different companies. And then I was going through a business incubator called Mass Challenge. 
in Boston. And one of my friends who I met in the program after we had graduated, he calls me up and tells me he had gotten a million dollars in seed funding and he wanted me to join the sales team. And so I always being entrepreneurial and starting my own companies, I thought this would be a good opportunity to learn something new, work in a venture funded business. And it was exciting. We were actually providing uh, mentoring platforms for universities, which I tried to sell to UMass, but uh, unsuccessfully for a number of reasons. That business has now closed. But when I got there, I soon found that my creativity, that that entrepreneurship that I love was pretty much wiped out the door. And I just needed to lock myself in a phone booth and call 100 people a day, book all of these meetings, deliver all of these demos, log everything in Salesforce, and my life became metrics. And that's really not what inspires me about entrepreneurship. I think it's amazing because you can take an idea, you can manifest it into the world, and you can let people interact with it. And that's what I really love. And that's why I love entrepreneurship so much. And just being forced to call people day in and day out was not giving me that same sort of passion. I just felt empty. Although I now had health insurance, so my parents were happy about that, but I soon just started yearning for creativity. And I actually started the company that I'm building now, Pickles, as a way of scratching that creative itch. So it originated from a desire to just make art without having gone to art school or knowing how I could even get started, I figured, all right, I can't make a drawing, I can't make a Picasso, but I might be able to do one one hundredth of it. And so the idea was to break up pictures into tiny, tiny little pieces and then have a lot of people all coloring one little piece of it, putting it back together and forming these mosaics that would take a thousand people only a minute to do instead of me who sucked at art spending hours making something that looked like garbage. So that was the original idea. And we built that, but then we didn't have any customers. Who's going to pay for that? And it's actually gone through a number of pivots, both in technology that we're using and in uh, kind of what our market is. But uh, now we are kind of asking questions and having people draw their answers to form, a, form this way for uh, creative collaboration so that everyone can just kind of unlock the creativity in themselves and also use it as a way of collecting this qualitative data that I know they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So we're getting millions of words in all of these different meetings and events that we're now using it with. So yeah, it's, it's changed a lot. If you saw the original version, it looks nothing like what we're doing right now, but they say you should be embarrassed by that first version that you push out there. And, and it's really come down to that, just uh, getting it out there, seeing what people think about it, and then learning and kind of making the next step. That was great, Chris, because what I was about to say, had you not added on that little end cap to what you said, this should be change. And change is good. And just being able to, it's like your foot is firm where you are, but then that's that pivot. And we both use the word pivot in how we describe what we do. Um, now I'll give it back to Jada. Awesome. So I'll ask Melissa, did you have any support from your community, family, um, or friends when you were starting your venture? And also, did you know anything about the negatives or positives to starting in your industry as well? Absolutely. So my background, as I mentioned, is growing up in a food business. So immediately my mother and family wanted to support me. Um, but I think there's a difference between the type of support that, you know, entrepreneurs of color get from their family versus others. So in terms of showing up, in terms of buying tickets, they were there. Um, but it was really challenging to get capital support. So as you know, um, one of the most challenging parts of any entrepreneur and business is raising capital. Um, while a lot of people bootstrap during their first round, during the second round, um, you know, the gradual progression is that you ask for friends and family to provide funding, um, but a lot of us don't have that opportunity. Um, so I kind of went, um, I decided to go back to school. Uh, so I went to Babson College for my MBA. Um, the school's really known for their entrepreneurial curriculum. 
Um, and from there really got the support that I needed um, to kind of start my business um, from taking uh, courses that helped me with new venture creation uh, to putting together a business plan. Uh, specifically the school has a course called new venture creation where everyone gets to pitch their business idea and you have to convince your classmates to kind of join your team and help you create that business plan. Um, so in a way I kind of cheated um, because my business plan was kind of um, a collection of efforts of five of my classmates. Um, but you know, I don't know, uh, to your point, Chris, I feel business plans change often and they become obsolete the moment you write them because your business changes every day. I think the most useful tool uh, that I saw, it's um, a tool called Business Model Canvas. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but it's a really easy way to kind of get your business model um, in, in check um, and kind of use that to kind of uh, check with other people to give you feedback when you're starting to put together a business plan without actually going through the robust uh, kind of challenge of putting it together. Um, but yeah, in terms of support, a lot of support, I really lean on the accelerators and the incubator programs that are out there. So the school that I mentioned um, had a number of those programs. So the Butler, the Butler Launchpad, as well as the WinLab Accelerator, which is the women only accelerator program out of Boston um, that really kind of helped me uh, kind of refine my business plan and my pitch um, to get to the rounds of uh, be, being able to feel confident to pitch in front of angel investors um, and pitch competitions. That's awesome. Tenzin, do you have anything to add to that question about your experience with your family and support? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I definitely, I was very fortunate to have support from my family, also the, the greater Tibetan community, um, Tibetan American community that is. Um, so my, my Tibetan friend and I, we looked at um, our respective communities um, and we decided to reach out organically, right? Because we start from small and we kind of bring our scope out wide. Um, and, and to Susan's question about, um, you know, how the original conception changed, um, we, uh, we started out very small uh, just to try it out. So we had around maybe, um, we selected 10 students, 10 um, college students to work with and 10 mentors. Um, but soon as, as, our, as word got out of uh, the program, as we were able to showcase um, at a Tibetan Ideas Festival held at Fordham University Law School every year, uh, we got more and more attention and more and more interest. So we subsequently had to scale it up and have conversations, um, really boiling down to feasibility, right? Because you can always scale up, but right, if you can't maintain it, then it's, that's another question and conversation. Um, but you know, initially we started off at college guidance, right? Um, I was the first in my family to attend an American university and go through that system. Um, and I think, um, yeah, like, like Michelle, I was fortunate enough to go to a private school which had some institutional knowledge and, and I was around some interesting people who know, knew how to do it. So I learned from them, right? My family hadn't gone through this process necessarily. Um, so that was our aim. But then slowly um, in this last year, we've actually focused more on professional development and we've shifted our focus and we've actually partnered with another organization called the Global Tibetan Professional Network. So we're slowly, um, reevaluating what's important to us and how we feel uh, we can best um, help our students. So again, sort of adding in this dimension of flexibility too, I think is really important. That's awesome. Um, I definitely wanna have Michelle hop in here and kind of share about your pivot in your business as well as your support in starting um, the bomb.com. And you're muted. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think very much to Melissa's point, I think just black entrepreneurs and just entrepreneurs of color in general, we do not have the same access to funding like everyone else. So for us, like a lot of my first funding came from my 401k. So I kind of took part of it to use as my seed and to really use as an MVP and minimum viable product to really see if this was something that was scalable. So for the first black, the black hole market started as a pop-up market. So it was in real life, in-person pop-up market where we brought together 15 to 20 brands and really designed these really beautiful loft spaces. So for each brand, I worked with the designer to really come up with their own brand voice, their brand aesthetic, because I really wanted to dispel these myths that were out there about black owned brands and 
um, if this is their first, um, if this is your first interaction with black owned brands, I want to make sure it was a, a good impression that you were leaving with your, cons your, new, cons your new customer. So um, I think in that first market, I had no idea what was gonna happen and how it, if it was going to be successful or not. And we had close to three to 400 people come at the, to that first market. Um, and I had since created four markets to date. Um, fifth one being in Boston, which was more of a store concept, which I was hoping to raise money on this year. But as I know, as we all know, COVID hit and retail became very unsexy. Um, so I have now shifted to online and being available 365 and having just an array of black owned businesses and products on my website. But even still, I'm going after my seed round right now. And my goal is to really um, create an ecosystem where you can shop black owned brands um, on our bomb.com. But in addition to that, we're trying to create like a target of a Walmart, if you will, for black owned brands and businesses. But it will also be a co-retailing model where during the day, you know, it will be a place where you can shop, but also after hours, we'll be educating and teaming up with folks at like Walmart and Target that I have access to and seeing how we can potentially get black owned businesses ready for these shelves, you know? And I think the misconception is that everyone obviously wants to be, if you're a product-based business, your goal is to be on Walmart or on Target or on Sephora shelves, what have you but nobody really knows what it takes to actually be there. So I've seen a lot of businesses um, think that they were ready for these stores, but go out of business within the next couple of years. And that's not what I want to happen with these black owned brands. So the bomb will be a launch pad for businesses to get their footing um, within like just understanding what it takes to be on the shelves, but then eventually, you know, you want your products to be seen everywhere. So we're trying to shift into, um, shift into a, a marketplace, but also like an, an ecosystem that builds community where black businesses can thrive. Michelle, were you, did you have a formal business plan or were you more conceptual concept, if you will, to market? <laughs> I did not have a formal business plan. I had a pitch deck. Um, it was more of a concept and I, I put it into, what would I call it? I did the business model canvas. Um, I did several, I guess it was sort of like a business plan, but it wasn't formal. So I had all of my ideas on paper, if you will. But I, I just feel like once you create a business plan, it's just, it changes. Like my ideas change so often that it just doesn't even make sense to me. So I just keep it to pitch decks and I swap it out when I need to. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I, I'm running my third, company, my third corporation, where I've mm -hmm. made seven and close to eight figures, and I've not had a business plan. Yeah. But I'm I always ready to change if necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If somebody really requires that, of course, I'll create one, but I haven't been asked for a business plan. I've been asked for a pitch deck, mm -hmm. but not a business plan yet. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, we're gonna go back to Chris. And the question is, how timely for this question, uh, what are the challenges of starting and owning your own business? And has that been exacerbated because of COVID-19? What's happened in the past six months or so with your company? Yeah, I mean, I think that entirely in, uh, depends on what business that you're starting. Like one thing that, I mean, we, have been building this platform for live events. And then when COVID happened, every live event stopped. And so we had to quickly, I mean, people hate using the word pivot now because everyone is saying it, but pivot to the virtual event space. But this left a big opportunity as well because there just weren't as many competitors in, that we were now facing in virtual events because it was totally new territory for everyone doing it. And so I think it's beneficial in that it has shaken up the status quo a lot, providing all of these opportunities for entrepreneurs to start new businesses, new platforms, because there's so many different needs in all sorts of different industries. Um, and so, yeah, you, you see all of these different virtual meeting platforms. I mean, Zoom exploded. There's a lot that 
kind of shifted value in the industry. And so I think for that reason, it is kind of exciting in that it just really has led to this growth and this explosion of innovation. Now, at the same time, like I would not want to be a restaurateur right now or have just opened my doors in March and now thinking that I was going to get all this foot traffic, all of this business, summer was coming around. Like if you're in tourism, it is really hard. Hotels, they are a lot of industries that have gotten hit super hard. And even the companies like Airbnb who are in those industries, but still startups are um, kind of more tech focused, like they are still getting hit really hard. And so I think that uh, it, it has really just, you, you get a lot of other opportunities and, and people are actively searching for some certain solutions out there because they have just been displaced and had to, uh, they can't just kind of do what they were doing because everyone is doing something different than what they were doing before the pandemic happened. For our business, it's luckily been uh, pretty good, I would say, because we have more people coming to us looking for ways to keep their audiences engaged online. But I think it really depends on your industry and your ability of staying nimble and pivoting as much as I hate that word. Don't hate the word, it's working for you. <laughs> yeah. Do you. Um, Melissa, the same question for you. What are the challenges just inherent in running your company and has it been affected by the pandemic? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges that a lot of people don't talk about is being an entrepreneur is extremely, it could be lonely, right? If you're the sole founder. Um, and I know I found myself at a crossroads when I graduated and had, you know, put together the business plan and it was, um, doing these pop-ups and pushing my business forward where um, I needed to go and get a full-time position. Um, so I'm actually the business development director at Commonwealth Kitchen, which is an award-winning food accelerator where we provide uh, business development and technical assistance to CPG companies and food service companies. So think restaurants and food trucks. Mm -hmm. um, so I provide them with day-to-day -day coaching on how to scale their businesses and find sales opportunities for them. Um, so I actually, during the day, have a full-time job and at night try to work on my startup. So, um, it is challenging, but I say all that to say that it is, it, it's all, it's also doable if you're extremely passionate about it. Um, with COVID, uh, Chris mentioned a lot, you know, my business was centered around in-person events, um, and that's no longer an option. Um, I actually found a, a new opportunity through the pandemic, um, a lot of small businesses were reaching out to me for consulting and just help on how to pivot. Uh, so a lot of restaurants, um, given that I had done a lot of pop-ups before, we're trying to figure out how do I design my outdoor seating? Do you know any architects, any designers? How, would I, how do I wrap my head around such a concept at an affordable price with material that's sustainable? So I actually was able to find a lot of clients during the pandemic, um, just based on the nature of the work that I do during the day. Um, and that's really helped to kind of stay, uh, to help my business stay afloat during this time. That's what we have to do. But we, we can definitely be resourceful because we're not learning how to run with just a company. We learn how to just operate our lives and, our op and operating our lives is our livelihood. And when you have to produce, you find ways to produce. And sometimes other people, like the people who have come to you for consulting, see in you, which you may not see in yourself, and look what comes of it. So thanks That's so much so for true. that. That's so true. I think it's important to just kind of listen to others and always ask for feedback. And sometimes you keep going against the grain, but sometimes you should follow where the wind is blowing you to go. So I completely it's agree so with true. you. Well said. Uh, Michelle, same question for you. What's happening with you in this time? How is this time for Black-owned businesses? So much has happened. And I feel like um, COVID was interesting to say the least um, because it, I think the main thing it did for me was allow me to pivot onto really focusing online. Although I launched my online business last year, what really kind of catapulted everything for me was the murder of George Floyd. So after the murder of George Floyd, my... <laughs> I don't even know 
what to say about my website and just blew up. So everyone was shopping black and felt the need to shop black. And I thought at first it was really unfortunate that people felt that just because, you know, somebody had to get murdered to really shine the light bulb on like why it's important to shop and support black people, but also black businesses. Um, but I had to really take my mind off of that and to really just, this is the time that I've been waiting for, for people to actually wake up to this concept and why it is so important. So with that being said, I had to think about what my next move was and I launched these um, subscription, the subscription box. Um, so the box allows you to get three to five products that are black owned um, shipped to your doorstep every month. And it's curated by myself and a few members of my team. Um, so that was one way since we were very reliant on in-person um, experiences and these markets, we shifted to really curating an experience um, online. So with the box also comes a, um, a founder chat where you as a consumer get to connect with the business owners of the actual products in the box. So you get to ask all of your questions. There are demos, it's really fun. Um, so we've gotten exceptional feedback from that. Um, in addition to that, people and other brands have been looking for ways to partner with us. So the reason I'm actually, I'm originally from Boston. I lived in New York for eight years and then I moved back to Boston, but I'm back in New York now um, because I'm opening up in a mall. Um, so I'm opening up at Hudson Yards as a partnership with a company called Forum who reached out to me um, to figure out what they can do for the, their d &I initiatives. So um, Forum is a company that's owned by Beta and they're in the lifestyle and beauty space. And to put into con uh, context what the Hudson Yards location is, it's, it was one of the only homes of Neiman Marcus. Um, it's right, it's in the, it's in a mall with Cartier, Fendi, like these really high profile um, businesses. So I'm excited to open up in the store this week um, in this mall. I never thought of the bomb as a mall store. So I'll be opening up um, on Thursday and it's an exclusive because I, I haven't told the public yet, but um, I'm excited to see what happens with the bomb. And I'm very much so um, raising my seed round right now. So I'm putting it out there to anyone on this call. If you guys are open to writing checks, you know, let me know. Um, so we have some really great ideas and I'm looking forward to what the future holds from here for black businesses in general. Tell me something, Michelle, would you call going into Hudson Yards a pivot? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I wouldn't say it was a pivot because we were used to doing stores before and, you know, in-person events. I think this is different because it's in partnership with um, a major brand and also in a mall that I okay. never really considered bomb a mall store. So this is just a, a way for us to get in front of new, new eyeballs. A lot exposure. of eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Tenzin, yeah. how have the past six months been for you and your venture? Yeah, uh, well, before that, I want to give a huge congratulations to Michelle. That's amazing. Um, and it really makes me think about the title of our panel today, right? It's, it's good doing business with you. But then I, I flipped that a little bit and I said, you know, doing good business, doing business, you know, which is consequential and good for our respective communities and societies um, at large. So it's really wonderful what Michelle has done. And when I return back to uh, uh, Morningside Heights, uh, hopefully early this year, I'm definitely going to stop by and get in touch um, and see that space. But uh, for me, the challenge is, um, I would say, like uh, what Melissa was saying, it's balancing, you know, something full-time outside. And for me, it's being a student. Um, I started Yeti when I was um, in my senior year, essentially in the summer of my junior year. Um, and now it's, we just had our third year anniversary in July. So that was a really big, a nice little milestone for us. But um, it was really, you know, being a student first um, and balancing that. And then after I graduated, um, I was fortunate enough to get a Fulbright scholarship and I'd moved to Seoul, South Korea to conduct research on energy policy. And being in Seoul, I was 13 hours away from the East Coast. So that was a huge um, time obstacle for me. But thankfully I had a really good support team um, with me that um, one of the, the partners was able to really um, step up 
And I think one of our other panelists mentioned um, the importance of having a good team around you that supports you and that also complements your skills. Uh, myself coming from the College of Social Behavioral Sciences, not focusing um, or coming from Eisenberg, I didn't have that business acumen or those skills. Whereas my Tibetan friend, she'd uh, gone to Vanderbilt and, and done business studies there. So she had the business acumen skills and, and the business planning and stuff. Whereas um, I brought some of the other um, cultural connections and, and those kind of other skills to the table. So I think, you know, in, in short, having a good partnership was really um, integral to that. And, and again, building in flexibility. Um, uh, in respect to COVID, um, for us, because we're actually a virtual platform, this worked out quite nicely. Um, all of our communications was virtually because we realized that the Tibetan communities are so small um, that people are scattered all over the place. Um, in Boston, I just happened to be super lucky that I had mentors who were close in age, but you know, what about that uh, Tibetan student who's in Burlington, Vermont, where there might not be a huge Tibetan community or people who've gone to do higher education, et cetera. There happens to be, you know, a larger contingent somewhere else. So that's why we used, you know, a virtual platform to get over those time zone um, constraints, um, also the community constraints too, right? For us, um, it's really developing human capital um, and filling knowledge gaps because um, as recent immigrants to this country, um, you know, we just don't have certain knowledge in respect to processes. So it's really, you know, by stumbling or through really getting great mentors. Um, I know all of us, you know, have had super great mentors who have helped us. Um, it was through their generosity and kindness um, that myself and a lot of people were able to get to where, where you know, we are. So that's really the driving factor of what, what we do. So thankfully, COVID hasn't um, impacted us because our, you know, um, platform is virtual, but, you know, we have shifted again, like I mentioned, to focusing on professional development with a realization that the reality of the job market is that um, a lot of people, you know, have to pivot as it were um, and, and be flexible and resourceful. And um, just to tie it off, um, I was having a conversation with the College of Social Beha Behavioral Sciences uh, this morning, uh, where I'm on the Dean's Advisory Board there. Um, and in 2018, I was fortunate enough to serve as the commencement speaker for graduation. And I mentioned um, the importance of like UMass character. And I think a lot of UMass students have grit and this determination and that we're all hustlers in some respect and regard. You know, We all uh, work hard and we chase and we earn. And it's that process of chasing and, and you know, really just you know, wanting it so badly that I think separates us you know, from the other institutions in our, in our consortium but also it sets us apart. Um, me being you know, two years out uh, with the other students I've kept in touch with in the Social Behavioral Science College, I see that trait coming out really, really well. Um, every summer I'm in DC doing work and I see those interns there and they all have that determination and grit. And I know all of us on this, on this panel has it. I know a lot of and probably everyone um, attending um, also has it. Thank you, Tenzin. And I hope that all of the attendees on this call are as enthused and as energized as I am from hearing from all of our panelists because running your business is exciting and there's ups and downs, but there's more ups than downs. And when you go down, you always bounce back up and it is what you make it. So thank you all so far. And I'm going to toss it back to Jada now. Thank you, Susan. I definitely want to piggyback off of that point. It's super inspiring. And I just, I just love the entrepreneurial spirit. And um, anyone who knows me, I engulf myself so much in entrepreneurship and business at UMass campus. So I'm um, hearing from you alumni and just having that spirit and hearing your amazing stories and journey is just amazing. Um, and one question that I have, and I'll start with Chris, is what information or um, knowledge do you wish you knew starting your your business? Um, I mean, there's so much that you learn when you start it uh, because I was introduced to the term street MBA when I was talking to someone and telling them about what I was doing. And they're like, oh yeah, you're not going to school to get that MBA. You're probably spending more money than you would actually in business school, but you learn those lessons the hard way. And you learn, I prefer learning as I am doing things. I, I just like am more active and I would rather make that mistake and learn it myself than read about it. 
because uh, it just it hits you a lot harder when you spend a hundred dollars on a failed Facebook advertisement than learning about Facebook advertisements. And so I think that, I mean, so many different lessons. Like I, I think one of them is that you don't like expect that success overnight. Like hearing everyone else's response to that last question, like since I've started Pickles, first of all, I started it in kind of nights and weekends working and putting my base salary in the full-time job to fund it. But since going full-time, I've also been delivering fruit for venture capitalists at 4.30 in the morning so that when they get to the office, they have all this fresh cut fruit ready to go. I have sold newspaper advertisements. I have installed furniture at apartment complexes. Like it's a hustle. And I think that just keeping your eyes open and, and staying alive is one of the biggest things. Like if you think you're gonna get in there, you're gonna make tons of money and it's gonna be like a quick cash out, like, yeah, you might be able to do that. And it does happen to people. And that's certainly like one way to going down it. But I really view it more as a marathon than a sprint because there's never any end to the work that you have. Like you will always be able to reach out to new people, tap on new opportunities, follow up with all of your emails, do stuff on social media. Like the work is endless. And so you really need to protect your time because you can burn out so easily. And so I, I think that the success can come slower for that, but that's also why they say every overnight success starts 10, 20 years before you actually hear about that person. And so, I mean, there's just so many lessons to learn, but I would say the biggest lesson is just to get started because you're not going to have all of those lessons when you start off and you're not going to learn them if you don't just get started doing something. And so whenever I'm talking to people, I will usually say just like get started with the easiest thing possible. And usually I think it's not even having an idea. It's just talking to people, talking to customers, reaching out. I send so many LinkedIn connection requests and I just say, Hey, I love what you're doing. I would love to find out more. And that way you're doing customer development, discovery, you're learning about their problems, their pains, you just pepper them with questions. And then that can all be mulling around in your brain so that it might result in some sort of product or service offering that can benefit them down the road. And then when you do actually build something, then you can reach back out to all of those people you originally interviewed and you can say, hey, based on what you just told me, we built this and this is why I think you'll love it. And I did not do that at all. I was like, oh, this will be a cool idea. I'm going to spend a bunch of money to build it. And then no one wanted it. And so I was pivoting with a product as it was already existing when I could have been doing so much more for free. And so I would just say that it is uncomfortable when you first start reaching out to people, but you get over that pretty quickly and people want to talk about themselves. And so if you are just starting off, I would highly recommend starting with that business development, starting by talking to customers and actually seeing if what you think is a problem is actually a problem to them. And then you just start de-risking your idea and, and slowly value validating it. But you certainly don't even need an idea to start. You could just think of uh, a problem or think of a population of people who you really want to help out, whether it is people from Tibet or black owned businesses like, if you just have a group of people who you're passionate about helping, then an idea to help them will naturally come as you start talking about them and learning about their lives and the pains that they face. That's definitely a lot of great information. I definitely agree with you about that entrepreneurial journey and how you, you kind of you kind of only learn when you are you are in it. Um, there's so much information I've gathered throughout the years, but it's not until you're actually in it, hustling and pushing through that you get all this information, you kind of change as you go. Um, so it's definitely a journey you have to step into. And like you said, just be courageous, just go out there and just do it. That's the only way to really kind of learn as much as you possibly can. Um, I'll segue to Melissa. What is some information you wish you knew, especially being in food? I feel like there's a, a lot of little things you have to pick up on. So what would your answer be? Yeah, I would start with pay attention in accounting and finance class. 
um, as someone who went back to school to learn that curriculum, um, you know, I did well in my MBA, got A's and B's, um, but not being able to understand your numbers, I think is like the best piece of advice because for a while I was leaning on uh, friends or people that I would pay to kind of do my accounting and run my numbers. And um, you, you, do, you don't want that. You wanna make sure that you understand how your business is being profitable. Are you cash flow positive? Um, because that's really how you're gonna scale your business. Um, so that's probably the biggest lesson. Um, I wish I would have paid attention to the numbers from the beginning as, a, as opposed to retroactively trying to, to fix it. Um, and then I would say, you know, I think being an entrepreneur has really uh, enabled me to be uncomfortable. Um, and I used to shy away from a lot of things from pitching or telling people the business idea that I thought because sometimes I was embarrassed and didn't think it was a good idea. Um, but you're the one taking the risk, not them. Um, so there's nothing you should be ashamed of. Um, and when you're uncomfortable is honestly when the most growth happens. So after you're comfortable a few times that you've done it, it's, it's a no brainer. You do it like it's your, your day-to-day -day job. Um, so I definitely encourage people, um, you know, to try to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, yeah, that would be my advice. Awesome. Tenza, do you want to piggyback on that, on what information you wish you knew starting your company? information that I wish I'd known um I think definitely looking back it's it's building in a degree of flexibility um and I know I've said that a couple of times but I think that's important because you know you can set the goal up very high but I think um, setting small wins um and small um gains is an important stepping stone because you know if you have a huge lofty goal and you don't get anywhere close to it it's very easy to get discouraged so I think, I think setting small attainable goals helps you climb the, the stairs a bit faster. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and I think another key thing is staying organized. Um, organization is such a critical tool to develop, especially in college. I know, you know, procrastination is up there. Still, I'm a huge, uh, uh, I'm still working against that um, as I'm still in school. Um, but, but today I was reading a book uh, for class and it's Samantha Powers, The Education of an Idealist. And she used to be the former um, US um, ambassador to the UN under Obama. And she had a really salient quote. Um, she said, um, never compare your, your insides to someone else's outsides. Again, never compare your insides to someone else's outsides. And it's very easy to do that, especially in these entrepreneurial spaces. Um, where it's just like, oh, how do I separate myself from this person? Or how do I, you know, it, the comparing game is very easy. But I think, again, you know, if you take a step back and you look at what's important and organic to um, your program, I think that's what helps it a lot. So um, things I wish I'd known, you know, to, to set, you know, reasonable goals, and it's fine if you don't meet them. Um, and to stay super organized um, because, you know, a lot of us have various things that are on our plate. Um, so, you know, definitely staying hyper-organized, using a planner of some sort, deadlines, et cetera. Um, I think those are all really good skills for our current students to cultivate. I can totally agree. And I know you and Melissa shared having full-time jobs and also continuing your startups. That's a lot to manage. So definitely organization and being on top of everything is important. Now, Michelle, what information do you wish you knew starting your business? Um, my information or advice would be not to quit your day job. So I very much, I'm sure like everyone on this call um, or on this panel started my business while working in corporate America. So I started it, was extremely exhausted because I would work um, like nine to seven and then come home and work on the bomb from like eight to one or 2 a.m. in the morning. And um, it was really exhausting, but at the same time, the early bombs were funded by my day job. So it was very crucial for me to have that at that time. Um, eventually I decided to kind of leave my day job and um, not to look for another one because I really want to pursue the business. But now in hindsight, when I look back, I probably should have stayed there a little bit longer, but everything happens for a reason. So no regrets. 
But at the same time, um, I actually got a lot of side hustles. So I was lifting, I was, um, I actually worked at, cause I know I wanted to open up a store. So I worked at a store, clean beauty store called Moulin to understand the ins and outs of being in a retail shop. So I kind of put myself through my own apprenticeship. So it's just, especially being some, being a black entrepreneur, not having access to capital. Um, my corporate job was funding my business in the early years. So just making sure that you understand, I mean, mostly being entrepreneur in the early years means that you will be broke and that's just the real of it. <laughs> so, um, it's just gonna take a very long time, hopefully not to get where you need to be until your business is profitable. So just figure out like whether that be your savings, how you're gonna actually fund your business in those early times. Yeah, that's a great point. I'll have Susan segue to the next question, which will kind of help tie all this to, together. Thank you Sorry, so before much. you do, can I quickly comment on one thing? Of course. Sure. What I realized, it, it was one thing I, looking back, which is so critical, is um, keeping in touch with people you reached out to, you know, um, those mentors or those kind of quick coffee chats or whatever that you've had with people along the way. It's really good to, you know, check in with those people again, um, to just see how they're doing, also update you, because they could, you know, end up being very helpful down the line. Um, and I'm speaking from personal cases and from others. So um, in the career that I'm pursuing with, with the State Department as a foreign service officer, um, some people end up you know, being your mentors and they end up going to really high places. Um, but you know, if you don't reach out or you don't maintain that contact later on, you know, um, it's a bit difficult to initiate that conversation. Um, so I think you know, keeping in touch with people, um, not forgetting those thank you notes, handwritten thank you notes, very nice, right? Uh, but just, you know, being grateful for people's time, I think is super important because you never know later on um, when that might come in handy. And then also it's just common courtesy too. Yeah, I think Chris touched on that too, on the, the customer facing side. So definitely both of those together can help build your business to what it needs to be. Yeah, Tenzin, I think that's an amazing idea because I reach out to a lot of people. I'm wondering, do you have any ways of organizing that follow-up and making sure that it's like you're actually reaching out to them. So it's not just in your mind. Yeah. Um, you know, personally, I have a little, um, I guess people don't use Rolodexes anymore, like um, Excel sheet of just, you know, people I've been in touch with um, that I like to just keep in contact with. You know, a lot of people I know, they like to send holiday cards, New Year's cards. That's one way. Um, every year you kind of have to do it. Um, so I think, you know, just keeping like a little, um, a contacts list is always nice. Nice. All right, Susan, off to you. Tenzin, you just gave me a little gift because my current business, which is called Business Class, teaches um, professionals, business owners and entrepreneurs, the importance of social skills, interpersonal skills, and standing out in high stakes and competitive situations because we are at a point now where people treat others as disposable, which you just mentioned how important it is to not do that. And the people that really connect, the people that do well, not just today or tomorrow, but years from now, are those people that make those connections. And it's so needed that I started a business based on it. It's so needed that at this downtime, I have been very busy. So always make time to connect and thank people. So with that said, panelists, you're all so wonderful. And you learn so much on campus. And those classes are interesting and you're learning you know, just different things you can do to get your business off the ground and the resources that you have. But at some point, your boots have to be on the ground you're out in the community. What are the resources, some community organizations perhaps, that you didn't hear about until after you left campus when you were actually working on your business and someone said, oh, there's an organization. Let's say for example, Commonwealth Kitchen is one such organization that helps 
food entrepreneurs get their food businesses together. Chris, what organization have you come across that you didn't know about just from campus? And you guys are putting me on the spot, each of these. <laughs> Got to lead off. All right. Um, so I would say that, well, when I was going through and when I was a senior at UMass, we went through the innovation challenge. And so we actually won $10,000 from UMass, which was incredible. That gave us an awesome kickstart to start our company. And then we actually went through Valley Venture Mentors, which is an awesome incubator out of Springfield with some great mentors. Um, since then, I've been through about four different incubators. And so I think those are great ways of building your network and of learning some of those skills that you need, uh, in addition to just getting more exposure for your business. Um, I would say that all of the different community organizations, like now I live in Montreal, and that is a whole different community. There's actually a ton of government support for startups, for entrepreneurs, like it's a great sandbox to be in, to have more time and experiments to find that product market fit. And so I think that there's, there's tons of resources out there. It is going to depend on who you are, like what kind of business you have, but there's lots of different organizations. And I think just connecting to those like-minded people who are five, 10 years ahead of you in their business is a great way to get started and to ask them who they connected to, what they went through, because then you can kind of model your path after that. But another thing that I really wish that I did while I was still at UMass was to network outside of the business community. Because I was, I mean, UMass was big. Coming from a high school of 500 people going to 15,000, it was overwhelming. And so just hanging out with people in my dorm, in the business school, in my classes, that made it smaller and that made it more comfortable. But when you are starting a company, you don't need just all business students because then you're gonna be competing over doing the same jobs and you're gonna have to outsource everything else. So I personally wish I spent a lot more time in the engineering department and computer sciences to make those connections and to meet those people who would have these differing points of view because that is really where some awesome ideas can be sparked and where you're much more likely to find these co-founders or these business partners who have those complementary skill sets so that you can come together and you can just start running in the same direction without kind of stepping on each other's toes and having to outsource whatever skills that you don't have. So I would say, yeah, while at UMass, meet other majors, connect with other people. And then, um, yeah, like I, I know that the, the idea, the challenge just ended, but uh, in the chat, it looks like there's a minute pitch also coming up. So I would say that those are just great ways of kind of getting your foot in the door, getting used to pitching. And then the people who you meet at those, they will always suggest you talk with someone else. And it's really about following those threads like I'll meet these people and they're like, how did you hear about me? And it's like, oh, well, so I was talking to this person and they said I should look into this community. And then after doing that, there was all of these people who I got connected to and you were a recommendation of one of those people. And so it's just like a lot of kind of, and I, I think that's a lot of fun too, because you end up meeting so many different people who you would have never normally met. So yeah, take those coffee calls, reach out to people, but also be open when other people reach out to you. Uh, and see how you can help them out as well. Because that I love connecting people. And when you can put two people together who really should meet and, and then kind of spin off and doing their own awesome thing, that is an incredible feeling for me. So, yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Michelle, you've been in Boston. You've been in New York. Speaking to the attendees on the call, if they're so energized, they're so psyched to get their businesses going right now after attending this this evening, what types of community organizations do you think they should look for? Doesn't matter what business, what type of business they want to start. What do you know of that's out there just to give people a hand? 
That is a really good question. I will say that um, when in New York, I actually relied heavily on um, the government programs. So there's a lot of government programs and grants for women that are starting out their businesses, specifically in New York. Boston, I'm still trying to get my footing, to be honest, but was really born in, in New York, I really relied heavily on just the government and the resources and from New York. Um, it's a thing from how to incorporate your business, um, how to get how to get proper accounting for your business, um, introducing you to your co-founder if you're ready to raise money, um, how to raise money, also really trying to figure out if your business should be um, should be, what is it? Like drawing a blank right now. But if you're registering your business for a specific entity, entity how to do that. So I relied heavily on Women NYC. Um, also just my peer network, to be honest, um, my peer network of people that have raised millions of dollars because I'm trying to be there too. And just um, sitting down and really just studying them and allowing them, allowing me to shadow them um, they've been really gracious in that and just I do a lot of cold emails so whoever is willing to sit down with me or on these days zoom with me um, I rely heavily um, on that as well so I'm trying to actually get back in the network so that's great that you know UMass is doing this because I feel like although I wasn't really entrepreneurial in college I really in the years that I wasn't really supportive of entrepreneurship UMass in my time there so you guys are very lucky to have this there's no it's, this is your time there's no looking back this is meant to be your time know that so just enjoy this and look forward and just be very, very clear on your goals. There's no apologies for anything. You're doing beautifully. Tenzin, what community organizations can you suggest to attendees? Thank you, by the way, Michelle. Yeah, um, I would say really look at the resources UMass has. Again, you know, we're a large research university. And what I realized very quickly were that there were so many resources on campus that you really had to like look for them, the ones that spoke to your goal or helped you get to where you needed to be. Um, CMAS being so, so instrumental. You know, I credit Wilma, Chona um, as two really important people in my career at UMass um, who helped me um, as a young man of color um, navigate his way through uh, UMass Amherst. Um, so I would say, um, really look for those resources because I think that that speaks that entrepreneurial spirit that I think all UMass students have. It's that hustle spirit that we all have, right? Um, and we just worked really hard. And, and to Chris's point, um, it's meeting people from outside of your college or your major um, and pursuing an interdisciplinary education, right? And seeing things through different vantage points. For me, I was from SBS, social behavioral science. Um, so I just didn't interact with the business school. Um, it, and I was in my own silo. That's a term we all use, right? You're just in your own silos. Um, and, and that can be very limiting, right? Because you, get, you don't see beyond those blinders. You don't see what's outside. So bringing other folks into the fold is really great and really integral because you can bring those skills to make up or to complement um, your team. So I wish I had taken <laughs> classes in Eisenberg um, or, or you know, in, in our School of Public Policy now because, um, you know, if it's not an entrepreneurial venture in the sense of, uh, sense, you know, uh, for capital, you know, we can also identify pressing community and public policy questions and problems and present solutions. You know, what we're all doing, in fact, is identifying a problem and creating our own solution to it. So the, the vantage point that I use is through policy and, and uh, developing policy tools and skills. Um, that's what I'm doing in my, in my program right now. Um, so I think that's important to look at um, interdisciplinary approaches and, and bring other people into the fold. But then I'd also, um, so that's what I'd say, like look more at every opportunity that UMass has. I mean, I wish I had taken advantage of this. Um, I'm so glad that UMass 
um, with Gregory's help, with Molly's help, or, you know, have these opportunities for students. Like if I know there was money around and I could present to like win it, yeah, I'd absolutely do it. <laughs> so, you know, everyone like you should absolutely, you know, do this, make a team. I'm starting to do that now at Columbia. Um, I last term I did, um, I got funding for a project on uh, solar panels in Uganda to look at a refugee camp there. Um, and that's, that was through energy, but I wouldn't have thought myself of, of doing that before um, had it not been for my initial venture. <laughs> So um, I would say that there are a, a whole host of ways. Um, if you look at um, all of the institutional um, resources there and also, you know, connect with um, admin folk, right? Um, there are people who know where these sources of money are and who wanna connect you to folks like, like CMAS, like, like your department. So there are always people who wanna support you. You just have to ask really. Thanks so much for that, Tenzin. Um, Melissa. I'm familiar with Commonwealth Kitchen, so I know that you're producing a lot of food entrepreneurs that get into like Whole Foods and a lot of places, correct? Yeah, absolutely. About 80 a year to be exact. Um, I'm sure that number is going to change due to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have a number of community organizations that I, I can recommend um, and I'll go through them. But I think before I do that, I think it's important to understand, to look in your own backyard, your own community. Like for me, it's find your tribe. Uh, so I have a group of women that we meet on a monthly basis to hold each other accountable. Um, because sometimes for those of us that don't have co-founders or members of a team, um, sometimes it's hard to kind of push forward on your own. So we meet on a monthly basis to hold each other accountable with different milestones that we have. Uh, not only, you know, to go through the challenges that you're having, but also to kind of celebrate the wins. You want some, a, a group of people who can help you do that. Um, sometimes that's family, sometimes that's friends or people that you intentionally reach out to. Uh, but yes, yeah, Susan, Commonwealth Kitchen is a great resource for businesses uh, who are in the food and beverage sector uh, who are looking to start their business. Uh, if you have a food truck or a restaurant concept that you're looking to kind of build, definitely reach out to us and apply online uh, to be part of our, our, our kitchen. Um, I would also say the city of Boston, um, and Michelle, we should connect, the city of Boston actually has tons of free resources um, and they provide a number of stipends for things like your logo, your branding. If you're a restaurant looking for outdoor, uh, to develop your outdoor seating, they actually give you thousands of dollars to do this. You just have to ask um, and they have, right now open enrollment for consultants to provide technical assistance. So if you need help um, with your e-commerce website or anything of that nature, uh, it's free and it's available uh, for, for the community. Um, another organization that I like for, uh, that, that I, I see a lot of uh, entrepreneurs being involved with is E4ALL. So it's a nationwide organization and they have small hubs and uh, in a lot of different neighborhoods, but they do pitch competitions like every other month from ranging from $1,000 to $10,000 in award. So it's just, I'm not gonna say it's easy money, like you do have to put a pitch together and pitch, but most of us already have our pitch decks that are created. So it doesn't kind of, um, it's, a, it's an easy win. Um, Boston Ujima Project does a lot of um, coaching and technical assistance that's free for entrepreneurs. Um, I recently came across uh, an organization called Pipeline Angels. Um, so they are angel investors uh, that are mostly women and individuals who identify as non-binary. And they look to invest in um, minority owned businesses and um, LGBTQ owned businesses. Um, so for those that are looking for funding that next seed round, um, I would definitely look into Pipeline Angels as another resource. Somehow I <laughs> knew you would have a list like that up your sleeve. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. I, I put some links in the chat, um, but happy to share more if, if you guys want. Uh, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you so much. Before I give it back to Jade, I just want to speak to something that Michelle said about not having your eye on entrepreneurship while you are undergrad, correct? Is, it, yes. is that what you said? Okay, so yeah. I am an Eisenberg grad, HTM. I went to work for a high-end hotel right after graduation. However, when I was on campus, HTM had an 800-hour 
work experience requirement. You could not graduate if you had not worked 800 hours somewhere in the hospitality field. So my mind was not on entrepreneurship. I wanted to work. My, my dream was to work for the Waldorf Astoria or some very high-end, well-known luxury hotel. I went to work for Sky Chefs Airline Catering. Airline catering is the most high-stress, high-volume thing you can do in the food business. Airplanes do not wait for food. So they are super fast-paced. Fast forward, three years after graduation, I was running my first company. And I could tell you how long it was gonna take you to produce something and it had to be done in that time because of that work experience. So whatever you're doing now to my panelists or to the panelists and to the attendees, it's all feeding what's going to happen in your future because you're gonna keep pivoting down the road. Jada? Awesome, yes, I can totally agree and relate to everything. I do wanna share my own personal experience just as a current student and also being from Boston as well. So um, as, a, as a female founder, one of the first centers I went to um, before even starting college was the Center for Women Enterprise down in, down in downtown Boston. That's an amazing center. It's kind of similar to what the Berthume Center does now where you get to sit down with um, somebody and really just share your business business idea. So that's one of the first things I, I did was sit down with them and just talk my idea out. Um, in terms of on campus, the Berthume Center has been very instrumental in my entrepreneurial journey just from being a freshman and just joining the entrepreneurship club um, to then going to seeing the transition of the center as well and what it does now um, to engulfing myself in all the pitch competitions, meeting with Carly or um, all of the um, advisors there and just talking it out. So definitely utilize all of the resources on campus, especially um, this center. Um, and this center can also connect you to a host of other connections outside in the Pioneer Valley, Pioneer Valley, as Chris mentioned earlier, Valley Venture Mentors in Springfield. e for all also has pitch competition in Holyoke as well. There's Grinspoon, which is an amazing um, opportunity as well. So there's so much um, at U that UMass has to offer for aspiring entrepreneurs and just resources to just get you started. So um, do not forget that. Um, so just to segue into our, our last question, um, how have you grown personally um, from this experience as an entrepreneur? What have you learned about yourself or what has it kind of taught you? And I'll start with Tenzin this time. <laughs> I think what I've learned, um, oddly enough, um, uh, so I'm an only child, so I'm very spoiled in that regard because I don't have any siblings to share stuff with. But um, at UMass, I was an RA uh, for two years and I, and I was responsible for 60 people, um, 60 freshmen. Um, and so I think that started my, my passion for mentorship. And as I expanded to a community um, that I personally identified with, um, it made it even more meaningful. So I realized that I was able to uh, be a leader in that respect um, and really um, impact people um, and see their growth because there's nothing more gratifying for me, especially um, just to see people's growth um, from their initial stage, be a freshman all the way to senior. Um, some, some of the folks graduating this semester, are, um, I'm really proud of them to see how much they've grown from their time as a freshman when we'd overlapped to now. Um, as young professionals who have um, taken advantage of internships, right? Like Susan was talking about, like, that's amazing that HTM, you know, had or has this, you know, 800 hour, right? That's a real practical degree <laughs> um, where you're getting those work skills. And, and you know, um, for those students on the call, you know, I know a lot of us are probably doing um, campus jobs or that's a part of us, right? Um, to really fund our education. I think a lot of our panelists also said that. Um, those are building the skills that will not only, you know, help you develop as a person, but get the job, but also, you know, um, cultivate those skills to be an entrepreneur too, because you may not see yourself as an entrepreneur sometimes. I certainly didn't, um, because I thought I had to go to business school. I thought I had to, you know, major in marketing or something. But um, again, I think I saw it through the lenses of public policy or policy where I identified an issue and I was like, I need to solve, I need to solve this or present some sort of solution to it. 
So, so don't count yourself out. Um, you know, I think everyone always has their own way to contribute. So um, that's what I learned about myself that, you know, I could, um, you know, help other people like look after them to an extent, um, but that I also had this ability um, to, to actually be a leader and an entrepreneur. Thank you for that response. Um, that was very in-depth and amazing. I hope the audience took some great notes from that. Uh, we'll segue to Melissa and what have you learned um, in this journey? I think the biggest lesson has been uh, being patient with yourself. I think sometimes we outline goals that at that moment we think are realistic and then when you don't hit them, you're, you're really hard on yourself. Um, I know when I started uh, my business, I wanted to create the next Italy meets Latin America. And I wanted to, you know, rent a huge warehouse and like create this marketplace. And I'm like, okay, that's not realistic. First, you start with phase one, doing your events, and then you gradually grow into something like that. Um, and I know it's been a reality check over and over again. Okay, not pivoting, but like realigning your expectations with what the reality that you're currently in, especially right now, given COVID, right? Um, so I had a huge proposal out to do this open air market downtown and then this happened. So now I'm trying to reimagine, okay, how do I work around this new reality that we're living in? Uh, so being patient with yourself and just, um, you know, things are gonna happen when they're supposed to and timing is of the essence. I also think, um, you know, for those students that are looking to be an entrepreneur, there's different ways that you can be an entrepreneur. Um, you could be an entrepreneur, which is an entrepreneur within an organization or a corporation. Um, and I think that's a valuable way for you to kind of gather your learnings before you kind of take the deep dive into kind of being an entrepreneur for your own business yourself. So there's different ways to kind of gather learnings to, to do what you're doing. Um, but for me, the biggest lesson has been being patient and then finding other avenues to gain the experience that you need for your own venture um, on someone else's dime, to be honest. Thank yeah. you, Melissa. Michelle, do you have anything to add about your growth throughout this journey? Yeah, I think um, what entrepreneurship has taught me is resilience. Um, there are so many times where I felt, not comparing myself to anyone else, but I felt that the average person would have probably broken down or quit. But understanding that my own strength really lies within and every time I think about like defeat or maybe I should go another route or this is not for me, there is someone, someone either reaches out to me with an opportunity or um, a business owner that I've been working with for the past four years right now. They're in the Jay-Z video that has happened. <laughs> they're in a Jay-Z and Pharrell video or they're mentioned in um, Beyonce's list of black owned products. So. It's, it's really um, satisfactory to see that, you know, especially with everything that's going on, like the spotlight and the time for Black businesses is now. And in 2016, when I started, that wasn't the case. So I think it's being a visionary of sorts and really understanding that not everyone will kind of see what you see, um, but it's really important for, um, for you to keep going and really show them why they need to pay attention. Definitely. I, I would describe this journey as um, with perseverance. There's plenty of times I was in Carly's office. And I was just like, yeah, I'm not going to do this anymore. So perseverance and resilience is definitely um, a big one. And what about you, Chris? What have you learned throughout your journey? Yeah. The, I mean, everyone, I definitely agree with like the perseverance is tough. I can't count how many times I'm like, just think to myself, what am I doing? Like this could be, so, I could do other things. I would be getting like a base salary that would be much more comfortable. But then you think like, no, this is exactly what I want to be doing. Like I asked for this and knowing that it is going to be hard, uh, like that is, and then you're not going to know which direction to go in all the time because like we've pivoted target markets. We've gone throughout different places and it really comes down to just outlasting people. I think like those are the successful people. A lot of times are the ones who just find a way of staying alive because you're going to fail a lot. And the best entrepreneurs are the ones who have failed more than the other ones. 
But as long as you don't let those failures kill you or kill your spirit, then and you actually use them as opportunities of learning and then kind of getting better and, and not making that same mistake or that same failure, that's just what the path is. And so by just getting comfortable with failure, like I've now, I like hearing no from people. Hearing maybe is the worst. Hearing yes is the best, but no's aren't bad because it just helps you find who is actually going to like it. And it, it's all about getting feedback and learning and getting a little bit better the next day. And I think that is what really compounds. And that's why it's, I think you get so many serial entrepreneurs as well, because it's like what I have learned from starting Pickles in the past four years, like it would be a shame to not start another company after this because just all of that lessons learned will make the next thing so much easier. And all of the connections I have make all starting the next thing so much easier. And you're not going to learn and do any of that until you just really dive in and you kind of learn on the spot. And so I think that's, uh, yeah, it, it's just like having that growth mindset, I would say, is, uh, is a big one. Carol Dweck wrote a book on growth first fixed mindset. And as long as you just like don't take failures too hard and you just say, well, yeah, I, I wasn't the right fit or I wasn't prepared right now, but that won't always be the case, then it helps put things in perspective and realizing that like what you're doing, entrepreneurship is exciting. Like you really, I, I haven't, don't think that there's anything as much fun as entrepreneurship. And I, I really do think that it's my calling. And I think, and a lot of people, they, they want to do it. They want to be their own boss, but they have those mental barriers that keep them from doing it. And, and so just as long as you can quiet that voice for even five minutes to say, all right, I'm going to pick up the phone. And I'm going to talk to someone who I've never talked to before and ask them what's wrong in their life. Like just those little steps then you realize it's not that hard. It's not that bad. And sometimes it will be that hard and will be that bad, but just keeping all of it in perspective and know that you're on the path that you want to be. Uh, and you, yeah, when, when you're asking to work late and hustle hard, it's a lot easier to do it than when someone else is telling you to. And so I think that's why I love entrepreneurship and uh, yeah, exciting to see the perfume center exist because I know when a lot of the other people here were going through UMass, it, it did not. And so, uh, yeah, it's cool just to see it kind of coming into the forefront as well. That was amazing, Chris. Thank you for all of that. Before I have Molly segue to a Q&A from the audience, I do want to have you, Susan, share how you have personally grown. You started three um, had three amazing businesses and all of us young entrepreneurs on the call would love to hear what that experience like was like for you. I, my dog started, just decided to play at the same time you asked that question. So that was my turning around. When I was at UMass, I knew what I wanted. And that was, I mentioned before, just that that look, that feel of working in luxury in a hotel. But what I actually learned on the campus was how to manage myself in any environment. But I didn't know it at the time because we all have so many iterations in our lives, but you don't see it right now. You're not gonna know it until you're at that next point. And then you're at that point after that. And then you're at that point after that. And this is, I'm answering your question, but I'm going to take a, a different route, which is that you have a choice to everyone on this call. You have a choice between creating your own dream or supporting someone else's. And everything is an idea. Everything is an idea. And a lot of things come from dissatisfaction. So I knew what dissatisfied me. And it was my second job where I had gone from five star to working at a convention center. And if, if they gave out stars, perhaps it would have been two. 
And that's where I learned dissatisfaction. And I said, no, I want what I have before. And I ended up creating it in my own company. How could I create my first company three years after graduation? Because I learned on that campus in Amherst how to manage myself. So if we don't get dissatisfied, we would be riding horses and buggies or, you know, breathing by candlelight. We certainly wouldn't be on Zoom. So think about, if you don't have your idea yet, think about what you would change. Think about that I wish sentence that you have, that you, how would you complete that? And then you will be living the life of an entrepreneur, a little dissatisfied, a little agitated, but always trying to make it better. And I have to tell you, it's so exciting. And I'm doing what I was meant to do, even though I didn't know many years ago what that would be. That was amazing. <laughs> I don't even know what to and say. And I will always give back, pardon me. That's why I'm still involved in UMass. I graduated a long time ago, but I come back because I got so much from it. Pardon me for speaking over you. Totally fine. That was that was really that was really great. I'll segue to Molly now. I have I have no words after that. No, so. I, I appreciate that. And uh, I, as an O four grad myself, uh, and giving back, and now being able to work at your alma mater, it uh, it's very different, but it's still impactful. And the I always say to people that the my four years in Amherst were the best in my life ever uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but it's, yeah, it's it for our alumni to be able to speak to our current students. I don't know that there's a stronger, more impactful voice. Am I right? I'll take that as a yes, that silence. Uh, we want to open it up to Q&A with our audience. Um, I, if you know me and you come to our Berthium events, I am a stickler for organization and I have to let some of that go with Zoom because it's just not that way. People are going to talk over each other and um, maybe ask um, uh, this duplicate questions, but I want to have a, an organic Q&A. If you've got a question for any of our panelists, feel free to unmute yourself and turn your video on so we can see you. Um, and yeah, I, will, I can also read out from the Q&A as well. Uh, Talia is asking, how long did it take to get your first client? Talia, if this is directed to a specific panelist, please let us know. All right, while we wait for Talia, does anyone have a question for uh, for all the panelists? How long did it take for you to make your first sale or client or what someone to use what you were doing? Let's uh, let's start with Melissa. Melissa, how long did it take to get your first what you would call a sale or an event or a connection? It's a good question. I don't know if I remember an actual time frame. Um, I think it's when I decided to actually put action into the idea that I had been working on. Um, I remember my first pop-up um, where I even contemplated not charging people for it. And then I remember having a mentor telling me like, no, you are a business now. You charge people for your services. Um, and I'll tell you, there, there was no better feeling than um, putting an event right up and actually charging people for it and seeing my bank account go up. It wasn't by a lot, obviously, as my first uh, pop-up, but um, I, it happened when I was in school. So I would say less than a year after I decided to kind of launch my LLC, I, I got my first clients. And Michelle, how long did it take you to make, you know, your first connection or get your first business on board with what you were doing for a service? Um, I feel like it was pretty similar. Um, I, my first customer came through events. So my first market that I did was in December of 2016. And I didn't know if anyone was interested in this concept of, you know, being introduced to buying black or a home for black owned brands. And I remember putting the event right up around Thanksgiving and being so focused on my computer on Thanksgiving. And at that time, the algorithm 
for Facebook wasn't as messed up as it is now. And you could actually see what, um, what people were talking about. So like the message around the bomb and buying black in general was very new to a lot of people. So it was very polarizing subject. So um, I think people really wanted to see what it was all about. In addition to that, I, I think I started to charge sponsors to be a part of it. So getting my first sponsor, my first sponsor was Essence Magazine and I had interned at Essence. So it was really a full circle moment for me um, where I got them to partner on my second market and those getting sponsors is probably the hardest thing that I had to do. It's, it's a little easier um, to get sponsors and obviously checks because I haven't, BC checks because I haven't gotten that yet. But I would, I would say that it's pretty comparable because you're asking people to buy into your, to your dream, essentially. And Tenzin, if you could chime in on the same question. Sure, I think for us, um, uh, when did it even start? Um, you know, it started off as an idea and we put it down on paper to be like, you know, how does this mentorship program look? What is a curriculum like? How do we do the outreach? Um, and for us, we were trying to get it done by, I think we'd start in May by July 6th because that's the Dalai Lama's birthday. So we thought what better gift um, to the Dalai Lama and to the Tibetan community by creating a program that empowers Tibetan youth. So. Um, thankfully, it was over the summer break, so you know we had a lot of free time at our hands. Um, but for us, we we kind of turned around in, in a couple of months, three-ish probably. Excellent. And Chris, how long did it take to get someone on board using Pickles? Yeah, so we had launched in April of 2016, and I just looked through my email. The first client we got was in September of 2018. So over a long time uh, and we had like rebuilt the platform on a new technology during that time um, and and then that was like that was amazing because it was like a good amount of money all at once and then after that they were like all right cool and we didn't get any other customers for months after that so it was like whoa cool and then nothing and so um yeah, it certainly wasn't like just meteor meteoric rise after that. It's uh, yeah, it was it was kind of like a one off, and then uh, just let us know we we're heading in the right direction, but still uh, a grind. And Chris, um, I'd ask if you don't mind, will you drop a few links in the chat for people can so people can really see some of the artwork and the pickle and what pickles does because it's very very cool, and I won't do justice describing it. So if you don't mind dropping some links, Chris, um, and it's Pickles, P-I-C-C-L-E-S, uh, is Chris's business and the artwork is phenomenal. Chris, if you have the UMass logo too, drop that in. I think you did that with one of the e club events or a class you were uh, come back for. Um, I have a question for Susan. Fanula is asking, Susan, can you kind of take us through what the three businesses you've started and how did the hospitality industry experience and customer service skills help you succeed? Oh, wow. Okay, so the very first company that I started was called Boston Unique Events. It was a catering and event planning company that I grew to one of the largest in the greater Boston area. I won Best of Boston, which is a pretty big deal. It's not like a Reader's Choice Award. And just something like that just makes your business regardless of where you are, just blow up even more. And I really loved it. It allowed me to take charge of my client's destination. It wasn't me behind a hotel or me working in a convention center. It was me and my hand-picked staff giving you what you want for your corporate event, for that lifetime event, be it a bar mitzvah or an anniversary or a wedding or whatever. And I did that for 20 years. The second company was called Lazy Susan Cafe. It was uh, near Fenway Park. And at Lazy Susan Cafe, I worked 25 hours a day because I did not listen to my advisors. My two most important advisors, my attorney and my accountant said, don't do retail. And I did retail because at the time, for whatever reason, for whatever was happening in 
business in the greater Boston area, I could not find that back alley space. My, my company had grown. I could not find that back alley space to do um, a catering commissary in the right location, you know, close to the Massachusetts Turnpike or, you know, major routes, which is where a caterer should be. And uh, it was wonderful. Great reviews, lines out the door, but um, working in the middle of um, Berkeley, Simmons, BU, Northeastern, um, I would have students work a day and quit, work a week and quit. And that took its toll on me. And I had a catering business where people were spending, you know, $100,000 wedding. And then I was selling a muffin. So you have to determine in your business, do you want that wedding? Or do you want somebody to enjoy your muffin? So I decided to go with, you know, the larger volume business. And then the company after that is what I'm doing right now. I sold Boston. I, I ran the cafe for three years. I walked away. One day I said the next catered event that I have will not be interfered with by that muffin analogy. And the next event that we had, I just locked the door. Sometimes you have to make a decision like that to save your sanity and your business. And I sold that company 10 years ago and that's when I started business class. And as I mentioned earlier, business class is really a culmination of that. It started with, an, initially it was etiquette and social skills training because I noticed that people just didn't RSVP. They didn't know which fork or glass was theirs. They didn't know how to make conversation at cocktail parties. And after witnessing that for so many years, I said, I'm going to teach them how to do it. And so it started out in etiquette and let's fast forward to right now. That's the last thing on people's minds. They wanna survive. They want to be able to connect with people whether it's virtual or face-to-face -face right now, they wanna be able to get that job. And anyone who needs a job right now, you have the skills, you're just affiliated with UMass. You have the skills to go outside of whatever your major is and get a job in another field just because you know that you can do that. And that's what you're getting. That's the education you're getting. Don't think it's your major. Molly, what was the latter part of that question? It was, how have your hospitality industry experience and customer service skills helped you succeed? It helps you, it really helps you to stand out amongst, in a field. I mean, Tenzin said it so well, but it's those skills. People are not buying your credentials. They're buying how you connect with them. They're buying how you make them feel. And that's what I learned at a very high level. And it was always important to me. Just, I didn't think of it in terms of connection and how you show up and all those terms that are very you know, popular right now. But it was, how can I make this you know, frustrated meeting planner or mother of the bride, how can I just make them smile when I walk in the room and know that everything is fine? And it's, is for some people it's natural for me it was learned but once I learned how to do it that was the key that opened many other doors and I do believe I would not be at all surprised if I have another iteration down the road thank you Susan appreciate that um thanks Panula anyone else have any questions for our panelists we've got lots going on in the chat um, and I can also, what I can do is um, compile some of these great resources. I can put them in an email and send them out to everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, we'll also save this recording. Um, and I'm going to drop another poll question, if you don't mind, just because we're curious. And we would love to know how you heard about this event. We want to know, we want to know what is working from a marketing standpoint. We're always looking to be better and do differently. Um, and if your option is not there, please, by all means, drop it in the chat, how you heard about us. We appreciate it. Anyone else have any questions for our panelists? Or for Wilma about CMAS or uh, for Zoom Center staff can help. And feel free to follow up via email. 
uh, if that is beneficial. We're dropping lots of stuff in the chat still. Thank you all, everyone, for joining us. I have one question, Marley. Please. Um, just for the audience as well, um, to the panelists, um, do you guys feel comfortable with students reaching out for any um, advice or just guidance in their own journeys as well? Are you guys open for that? Um, just in case they reach out and you, you guys don't want that, just to put that out there. LinkedIn okay with our panelists for a connection? Excellent, LinkedIn. Great for me. Great, yeah. great question, Jada. Thank you. That's huge from a um, networking standpoint. Asking nowadays, there are so many ways to connect with people. Asking a preference really makes you stand out, I think. And again, I'll add one thing. Please. Oh, sorry. Um, as people are, are thinking of questions, um, I'll say one thing which is nice to do is do some reflective writing, do some introspective writing, and take stock of your journey so far. Um, because oftentimes in university, you know, we're running from the next thing or in life, we're running from the next thing to the next thing. And we don't have time to, you know, sit down and appreciate that growth we've gone through. Um, back to one of the questions um, both Susan and, and Jay deposited to us. So um, I think it's, it's good to do that because that helps you know who you are. And, and for this, um, for entrepreneurship, for your venture, it gives you a better sense of what that venture is. And then you can see that growth too. Um, that process is really, really um, good personally. And then translating that into the dollars, applying for grants. What's your story, right? What's the pickle story? Now, what's the Yeti story? What's the bomb story, right? Um, it's knowing that story and then also seeing the growth of it. That's really, really a good exercise um, that I hope a lot of students do. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, um, a grant application. It can just be journaling. It can just be writing. Uh, but from my perspective, um, my background is applying for um, national scholarships, fellowships, and grants. So that process of distilling yourself and what you stand for in your goals in 600 to 800 words is a really tough challenge. Um, and I'm really enjoying um, editing people's work, especially these personal statements, to see what drives them and what motivates them. And, and there's an element of introspection that's required. Um, to really get past that hurdle and that gate to unlock those opportunities. So while you're in college, I really, really, uh, or you know, at any stage of your life and career, um, just take stock of, of that journey and do that introspective look um, and ask yourself those tough questions. Um, you know, who you are, what you stand for, what matters for you and relate that to the venture or to whatever aspect in your life. I think uh, we, we all kind of owe it to ourselves to do that introspection. And I will ask one question that usually um, I had a lot of members from the Entrepreneurship Club when I was on the board ask is, where do you get started? Uh, what is some advice you would kind of give students now who have these ideas, have this spirit, and then, you know, I don't want them to get, oh, what's it, analysis paralysis. So where would you um, suggest they start? Just buy the domain name. The rest of it takes care of itself. Once you get the domain name, no one can steal your idea. <laughs> um, I would say just start, honestly. Like at this point, it's almost like I feel like there was the bomb was in my head for about a, a good year or two. And I'm being generous, probably a little bit longer than that. But I got to a point where I made a goal at the top of 2016 where I was like, if you don't do this business, you are gonna feel like a, a complete failure. I was a little bit harsh on myself, <laughs> but at the same time it worked. And I'm like, if this is the one thing you do this year, just start this business and see what happens and invest in yourself. Um, so I just took the leap and I invested in myself and created that MVP to tell me exactly, you know, if I wasn't willing to spend money on my business, then who else would be? So just take that leap of faith and start. I think for me, I, I would say put a fork in the ground and do something that's public facing, even if it's to your friends and family. Um, because once you have the pressure of kind of sh presenting or showing an audience, um, that's how you get your first client. At least that's how it kind of worked out for me. 
kind of putting yourself out there. I'm going to interrupt real quick. We just had a question from the audience. Uh, for those of you who have teams uh, working on your business, your venture, how did you find those people who are part of your team? Um, if uh, you've got a team going, uh, let's start with Melissa. Do you have a team going with um, Melissa's a solopreneur? Awesome. Michelle, do you have a team working on BOM? Um, yes, so I work full time, but I have um, an intern who's been working with me for the past two years, and I have an event producer that has helped me um, with every single pop up market. So I really hired against my skill set. So the things that I knew I was a really good marketer and I worked in marketing for the past eight years, so I knew how to get my product in front of the right people. But what I didn't know is how to execute on an event. Like I never threw an event or knew I had all these ideas in my head, but I needed help executing. So I hired um, an event producer to help me. Um, my intern actually volunteered. She saw what I was doing and reached out to me via LinkedIn. And she just really wanted to be a part of the bomb's mission. So I think doing a call out and see who's really, who's really interested or really paying attention to those people that reach out to you. Cause those are like, she's been the most dedicated person a part that has been a part of my team. And that just happened through her reading a article on LinkedIn and reaching out. And Tenzin, did you, do you have a team working with Yeti? Yeah, I do. Um, it happened to be another, um, college student that I just reached out to my network. So definitely I'd say, you know, look in your networks, try to find friends um, that you can kind of pitch these ideas to. Um, and then also um, to expand your network, you know, find community um, through some of your passions or your skills. Uh, whatever country I find myself in, I make sure I play tennis and I meet people through tennis because that's what really um, I love playing it and you meet so many interesting people and then you're able to introduce your ideas and get a sense of that new landscape. So I'd say definitely, um, you know, use your passion and your skills um, to meet other people. And then to um, uh, Jada's question, I, I think Chris's comment was so perfect, like buy the domain name. I wasn't about to buy Yeti because that's the same as Yeti coolers and that was very expensive. So we tacked on a dot US for that. But um, one advice is um, again from the book from Samantha Powers, uh, what they say in the government at the National Security Council is um, GSD, get stuff done, you know, like like our panelists were saying, you know, you'd be like, oh, I'll start this later. I'll do that. No, if you wait, you're never going to get to it. So um, they use another, you know, four letter S word, but, you know, get stuff done, I think is really, really important and having that attitude right. because you can wait, you know, but if you don't do it, you know, you're never going to start. So you have to push yourself a little bit. Tenzin, will you drop uh, the link to that book in the chat so I can compile it for um, our attendees? That'd be great. Thank you. Chris, do you have a team working with you for Pickles? Yes, I, I do have a team and the team has grown, shrank, it has changed. Um, I actually started off because uh, I don't have a technical background and I was trying to build an application. Uh, uh, so I had no idea how to get started. I started talking to people in my network and I got a referral to an iOS developer because I thought I needed to build an iOS app at the time. Now, I thought he was a professional. He just liked the idea of working on Pickles a lot more than actually doing it. And so that ended up being almost 18-ish months that I pretty much wasted with this person because he would just keep giving excuses as to why something, why the new build wasn't ready. Like I was just following up with him and I didn't know enough to actually call him on what he was giving me. And so that was, I mean, it was, it was pretty terrible, but uh, like even when, I mean, then you kind of learn and you grow and, and you appreciate developers a lot more. And so when I moved here to Montreal, I didn't know a single soul in the city. And I started going to tons of networking events and I would just, started building my network here. Now I know lots of people and I run into people on the street who I know, which is an awesome feeling. But I, I've like had outsourced teams where I tried to outsource the development. That has never ended up working very well, I found, because you can't just align on the mission. They don't really care as much when they're not 
meeting you in person and they're just looking to maximize their profits and even sometimes build something that only they can service and work on. So you're kind of uh, handcuffed to them and that's not the right approach. I think finding someone and selling them what Tenzin was saying is why the story is so important. People buy stories. When you start telling a story, they will listen to it. And it's a way of kind of hijacking into people's emotion and getting them to really empathize with you, believe where you're going and want to join you if it's compelling for their thought process and who they are. And so when you can get a team of people who really are passionate more so than just collecting a paycheck, uh, it it's amazing. And so, uh, yeah, I, I now kind of work with people who I have met or who I know. And, and I think just, just knowing people who have the complementary skill sets, I know we've said it a lot, but don't just let your friends join because they want to join, because that's how you can lose those friends when you have kind of differing views or you wanted to blow it up and they just wanted to kind of have something fun to do to tell people at the bar and just like having that alignment in terms of your vision, your mission, your, your work effort, because if you have a full-time job and they're going all in, they might start to resent the fact that you're not putting in that nine to five hours. And so, um, yeah, I think having someone in there is great because it makes those lonely entrepreneurship nights, at least you have someone there who's kind of in the trenches with you. But knowing that that is the right person, I would say that the majority of startups will fail because of these founder problems or misalignment or just not having the right team. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a, been an evolving thing. The birthing center puts on a fantastic, uh, program that we call build your team, how to build a team. So if anyone's interested in that, Carly Fricotti can certainly help. Uh, any other final questions for our panelists? from the crowd. And as I said, I will, um, I'll compile all everything in the chat that's beneficial resource, and I can send that out via email. And this recording will be, be available on the Birth Room Center YouTube channel. So everyone will get that via email. Um, I don't see any further questions. So I, I would, again, like to thank the panelists for their time uh, at, after hours, uh, spending time uh, for your alma mater. We certainly appreciate it. And